Thank you, Dr. Gagne. I have one final introduction to make before I hand off the microphone to our moderators. It's my great pleasure to introduce this year's recipient of the Andre Crody Award for Distinguished Service in the Profession of Surgery. Uh, he will also present the 2022 Andre Crody Lecture, but first, a little bit of history. Dr. Andre Crody was the first president of the U.S. section in 1937, and he backed that up in 1938 as the second ICS world president. In 2014, our college unanimously, unanimously passed the resolution to create the Dr. Andre Crody Award for Distinguished Service to the Profession of Surgery in honor of his quite numerous contributions, not only in the profession of surgery, but also to the growth, success, and prosperity uh, of our college. This year's recipient is a professor of surgery at the Georgetown School of Medicine, the director of kidney and pancreas transplantation services, and the director for quality at the MedStar Georgetown Transplant Institute. He is also the current president of the United Network for Organ Sharing and the Organ Procurement and Transplantation Network. At our scientific program, uh, what, correction, as our scientific program was being developed, we included a session on transplantation as well as a topic related to ethics. I was also extremely delighted to nominate Dr. Cooper for his distinguished representation and recognition in this field. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Matthew Cooper uh, would please come up. I would like to recognize him first and then he could present his talk on the global evolution of kidney paired donation for patients with end stage renal disease. So good evening, everyone. Can you hear me okay? It's really a, an honor and a pleasure to be here. Uh, I want to thank Dr. Perlmutter and the planning committee, thank our distinguished uh, chairs of this, uh, this meeting, uh, particularly my, my friend, uh, Dr. Peter Keneally, who's a transplant surgeon from Denver. We've spent a lot of time together, and I'm, again, really privileged to be here to give the Crody Lecture, particularly with the history of Dr. Crody as well as those that have been uh, honored to receive this award in the past. I'm incredibly humbled. I will brag about this award for the rest of my life. I can promise you that. <clears throat> I um, let me see if I can get this to. If we can start my slides. So uh, I'm going to talk about a, a topic that's very near and dear to my heart. Uh, full disclosure and without apologies, I'm I love what I do. Uh, I'm very animated often when it comes to presenting. I have a difficult time sometimes standing behind a podium. I use my hands a lot. Um, but again, I hope at the end of this, even if you're not um, directly affiliated or have connections with transplant, I hope you'll find sort of where the future of our field is going is incredibly exciting. Uh, as mentioned, in addition to my uh, role as a transplant surgeon, I also serve as a president for the United Network for Organ Sharing, which is the organization that oversees donation and transplant in the United States, and I'll show you some slides about the success of transplant here in the U.S. And again, I, I hope again that um, it not only uh, folks find this talk interesting, but hopefully will be motivated you know, to continue to support our efforts in transplantation. I have a few disclosures here, a number of uh, post-transplant diagnostics uh, with which I consult. I'll start um, in terms of background. <clears throat> While uh, there's a, a lot of incredible topics, I've reviewed the agenda for, the, for this upcoming meeting. Um, End-stage renal disease, in my mind, perhaps doesn't get enough press. It is truly an epidemic in the United States when we think about the number one and number two causes of kidney failure, hypertension and diabetes being so prevalent. The fact that we see these numbers continually rising, um, a, a simple transplant surgeon can see this, the rise of end-stage renal disease and the blue line up top uh, and that of uh, transplantation nowhere near sort of making, uh, the, uh, the, the, the making up the need, you can recognize that we still have a long way to go and there's still many opportunities. Um, like I said, I'll also say that transplant here in the United States is incredibly successful. 
We celebrated our 11th straight year of increasing numbers of transplants, over 40,000 transplants. We celebrated that in the middle of December. The actual number is 41,435. We were so excited about that. That's over 40,000 lives saved through organ transplantation with increased numbers in, 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 in uh, certain programs that you see here on this slide as well. But while we're continuing to be happy with what we achieve, we have to recognize there are still tremendous opportunities. Uh, the oversight of transplantation is well recognized and the numbers are something with which we continue to focus a lot of attention in the United States. I can tell you today on uh, the public website the number of people that are actually waiting for an organ transplant. I can tell you the time with which people are transplanted and so forth and so on. And so while we continue to be excited about the numbers of transplants and the number of new listings, the things that unfortunately are sometimes are forgotten are that the fact that the waiting time of a deceased donor transplant being around five or six years on average means that a good number of people never actually receive their gift of life and unfortunately die while waiting on the list. They become too sick and have to be removed for a transplant and for other removals. And so we again are very excited about those numbers that we showed on the previous slide. But again, until we can ensure we have one transplant for one patient for one lifetime, we still have obvious work to do. I'll also say that in terms of transplant versus dialysis, I always talk about that as in some ways in apples and oranges comparisons because if you see at the patient survival rates, one year, five year, and 10 years, dialysis in the yellow, gray, and blue being deceased donor and living donor, this again is an is a unfair comparison. I tell people who have come to see me for an organ transplant that have been on dialysis for 10 years, and believe me, there are folks that have waited 10 years to actually come to transplantation because they're unaware of that opportunity their survival is about 20%. And those folks, I say, you should play the lottery because four out of every five of your friends, unfortunately, have not survived to this time. When you look then at the differences between deceased donor transplants and living donor transplants, again, still celebratory, but there is a significant survival advantage for living donor transplants. That may be obvious. Living donors are very uh, a pre selected group of folks that are very healthy have excellent renal mass, and you can imagine that the, the relation between a deceased and living donor also being able to avoid things like brain death typically translates into that improved survival that we see with living donation. Now, when we talk about kidney pair donation, and we'll go into each of these in, in some detail, and it's very interesting because they all have an amazing story. And we now look back, you know, almost 35, 40 years when folks started to f first think about kidney pair donation, it seems like, boy, well, I don't know what took so long. But you'll see throughout the, the course of, of my talk and throughout the course of time, there's always something that perhaps was holding us back. And, and now, as I stand here in 2022 and think about that well over one-fifth of all of our living donor transplants are through paired kidney exchange, it's pretty exciting to see where we've gone. So in terms of a timeline, I think it's important to hit the highlights. I'm a, a fan of, of surgical history. The, the first uh, KPD transplant was suggested by Felix Rappaport, who was actually very much involved in HLA and looking at antibodies and thought, boy, it's a shame that we can't do living donor transplants through compatible folks by just trying to change donors and recipients. There was a lot of consternation. Boy, that sounds like a great idea. Nothing. It got, was very quiet until all the way until 1991 when the first program in South Korea was started by Dr. Park. It's then spread to Europe uh, in the, the country of Switzerland. What's really exciting and ironic, I guess, the fact that we are actually sitting here today, the first KPD transplant in the United States was actually performed here in Rhode Island. A small kidney transplant program, they do about 50 or 60 transplants a year. Incredibly exciting to celebrate that. But this is the place where actually kidney pair donation began in the United States. I was actually uh, privileged to be training at Hopkins in 2001 when we actually began our program there. Uh, and it continues to be recognized as one of the, the pillars of, of living donors and paired exchange. We then see the Dutch. You'll hear terms about never-ending altruistic donor chains that are started by uh, non-directed donors who actually allow for a number of transplants to happen rather than a one-to-one -one, uh, uh, activity. Uh, legislation was passed in 2007, which actually allowed us to be more confident in moving forward with paired kidney exchange, removing the concern that uh, exchanging organs between folks that did not know each other was a concern for valuable consideration. The Charlie Norwood Act actually fixed that. You'll hear about a number of national uh, organizations, one of which is called the National Kidney Registry, which is the largest um, U.S. paired exchange uh, uh, program that act does uh, the majority of the KPD in the United States. Uh, multi-center transplants and the organization, like I said, UNOS, began its KPD program in 2010. Uh, a little bit of interesting information around the world that Dr. Park that we talked about before, 
um, the uh, information data that's come out of China. You can see that uh, th this resulted in 179 kidney transplants that were performed uh, over the country of 16 transplant centers. Uh, started with 70 non-directed living donors who actually were able to allow for transplants in these 179 pairs. What's interesting and you, what you'll hear is uh, unfortunately a common uh, challenge we have with paired kidney exchange are blood type O recipients because obviously uh, typically to be compatible the folks would need a blood type O donor and most O donors are able to donate to any other recipients being the O uh, universal donor and so we have a lot of folks that are blood type O that are challenges in paired kidney exchange. Information from the Dutch, uh, 472 combinations consisting of the pairs you see in front of you, successful of 187 transplants, was about 40% of the pairs that were enrolled. Uh, most of the recipients you'll see are uh, an effort was made to try and assure like versus like so that folks were not losing the valuable uh, living donor that they brought in, at least in terms of age. And so again, a lot of success in the Dutch program. When you look at uh, Australia, they were again able to demonstrate about 50% of their pairs were able to be transplanted. But what's important to recognize is that there still are some disadvantages based upon sensitization. So folks that have lots of antibodies, those that are typically exposed via blood transfusions, pregnancies and previous transplants are the ones that we have the most challenges with. If you look at this data on the right hand side, the bars of the light gray are the percentage of the overall program uh, with that have this level of sensitization. It goes from zero to 100%. Zero meeting, no antibodies, 100%, as you can imagine, being very difficult to match. But again, as we travel across, you can see the biggest uh, component of any paired exchange program are your highly sensitized patients, uh, PRAs of 96 to 100%. But when you break those out into these two bars over here, really the breaking point is for people that are over 97%. They're very difficult to match. They're very difficult to find a compatible transplant for, and we still consider that to be the challenging group in pit care, paired kidney exchange today. The Canada uh, experience, you can see the, the overall numbers of uh, pairs that are participating in paired exchange over the course of about uh, 20 years here. But what's interesting about the Canadian program is they actually have something called match cycles. So three times a year they actually run this, this program, this national program. They do a lot of transplants at one time, uh, sorry, three times during the year. And then the rest of the year is a matter of sort of building up those pairs to allow for a robust database to find matching, particularly for those difficult patients. Overall, their data is, is incredibly exciting. They've done uh, almost 900 transplants, um, about 80 per year uh, with those three match cycles, with most folks waiting a little about four months once they're added into the program to find a match. Um, what we find, however, is that uh, the examples that I gave you are unfortunately a minority because what we think have appreciated is that the success of a paired kidney exchange program nationally really depends upon a robust deceased donor program and there are many, many reports in the literature that demonstrate that there really does need to be uh, more and more efforts to develop paired kidney exchange, particularly in uh, countries uh, of lower socioeconomic status and for those that have particularly large geography and a difficult time trying to bring organizations together for paired kidney exchange. Um, so when we talk about size, unfortunately size matters. So in this particular instance, we find that there is some value in considering the advantages of national programs versus single center regional programs. Now there are some advantages for both, but when you think about a national program, that of course demonstrates that you're going to have a larger database. So if you have uh, programs that are putting in pairs all around the country, you can imagine that allows for more opportunities. But it does then require some standardization of how programs are evaluating their donors so that everybody is assured that what is a donor in their program is also an acceptable donor in another so that we are not hurting one person trying to help someone else out through paired kidney exchange. The regional programs are, are, are more nimble and there are some single center programs I'll show you in a second that are very successful but that does result in a smaller patient database and it may have some for that reason geographic disparities. Um, it still continues to uh, be uh, challenging for high PRA patients because again the smaller the pool, the more difficult it is to find matches for those people. And it depends typically on the expertise of one or two people. And if those one or two people happen to be on vacation, the paired kidney exchange program actually goes on vacation with them. Uh, a, uh, an example of a single center, very successful paired exchange program, Dr. Bingaman uh, in UT San Antonio, really over an incredible three-year period as he was getting his program off the ground, was able to perform 134 transplants. Um, the data within this paper shows that he is able to really ref have patients referred all around the country.
country so that he uh, typically has a pool of about 200 pairs that allow for these incredible numbers in a single center, which have really been unparalleled in other, any other program around the United States. How about these uh, national exchange programs? There's a number of them. The one I'm going to spend the most time on is the National Kidney Registry, of which we are a major uh, uh, participant. There's the one that's uh, from UNOS or the OPTN, and then the Alliance for Paired Donation, which has done some pretty exciting things, particularly in global paired exchange programs. The, the, where we started, it seems rather simplistic, but actually it's very interesting and, and at the same time, like I said, surprising. It took us this long to say, if you have a donor and recipient or unable to donate to each other, um, we just swap our donors to, specific, to other recipients and we allow for two living donor transplants. What was sort of a, an expectation was that the donor operations happen simultaneously. Well, why? The concern was initially, if one donor actually donated to their recipient, their recipient now having a transplant, would their donor say, eh, I'm going to back out because all of a sudden I got what I intended to have, my recipient received the transplant. When you look at that data, you find out that that rarely happens. And that really has allowed us to move much further in kidney pair donation than we probably initially thought we would be able to. And then we talk about non-directed donors who would come to a program saying, I wish to donate to whomever is in most of need. There was a lot of sort of consternation about how those recipients should be chosen, but most of the time it was an individual on the wait list who, again, was either someone who had been waiting for a long time. If they happened to match someone highly sensitized, a lot of times it was to a child. But really what this demonstrated was with a one-to-one, -one, was there, again, more opportunity for us to, to uh, have greater benefit from that, um, from that uh, potential gift of life. Uh, we then have moved forward to utilizing a thing called chains, so those non-directed donors. A program has a number of incompatible pairs and recipients in the database. This non-directed donor donates to a recipient. The, a chain of uh, other recipients uh, actually receive their gift of life. And then at some point, a donor is available, and the donor can actually wait. We call that a bridge donor until a number of other pairs are actually collected into that national database. They can sometimes be separated by weeks, sometimes separated by months. And this can continue forever and ever, almost as you can imagine, until oftentimes at the end of this uh, chain, the donor does donate to the deceased donor wait list. And so one uh, non-directed donor can sometimes lead to the record is about 60 transplants that actually occurred over a two and a half year period. So really remarkable how the, the youth community has come together to allow for a number of transplants through a single non-directed donor. As I mentioned, the National Kidney Registry is the largest clearinghouse of paired kidney exchange in the United States. It has almost performed 6,000 living donor transplants over that time period. 95% of recipients are able to find a compatible match. The growth, like I said, is, is absolutely astounding. When you look at the overall number of living donor transplants uh, on the, 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 excuse me, the number of, of paired kidney exchange transplants with the yellow bars, you can see that the, the number is of paired kidney exchange that's facilitated by the NKR is about one in every five. So now when you think about living donor transplants, you recognize that we have become sort of smaller of a community allowing for this exchange of really a national resource to allow such a significant number of individuals to receive a living donor transplant. The success is unparalleled when you look at the data of the, the, the National Kidney Registry compared to uh, standard uh, living donor transplant uh, and even single center paired kidney exchange. The outcomes are outstanding in part because with the larger pool of, uh, of uh, potential donors and recipients, the ability to perform high level molecular matching means that the outcomes are even better compared to any standard paired exchange program. And what does that mean in terms of waiting times? Again, absolutely outstanding when you look at it over the course of, this is really only from 2011, but most recipients only wait a little over a month and a half before they find their compatible match. And so I tell people now, I, I, it's no longer necessary to think about, is this donor compatible to me versus with blood type or with HLA? The important thing is there's someone who's available who meets medical and psychosocial criteria, and if we put you in the paired exchange program, we're going to find a match for you. Well over 95%, and neither donor nor recipient is going to have to wait very long. And that's incredibly important when we get back to thinking about those folks that have high PRA. You can see over the course of time, the numbers of those patients has continued to increase, including some of those very hard to match patients with a CPRA over 95%. And so that's, again, the reason to participate particularly if you have highly sensitized recipients in your program because this is the way in which you find that, in, that compatible match, sometimes having to look at a donor pool which is on the other side of the country. And we do a lot of exchanges in Washington, D.C. with programs on the West Coast for that reason. 
Uh, what that has led to is a, 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 a decreased need for things like desensitization, so trying to remove antibody with utilizing techniques like plasmapheresis and IVIG, which have always been a little bit difficult to manage and very um, sensitizing in themselves. And so you can see over the course of time, there's actually fewer and fewer of, of folks that actually have to go undergo any form of sensitization, despite the number of uh, NKR transplants continuing to increase. That doesn't, however, mean that it goes away. In fact, there are some opportunities where we have patients with a high PRA, and they may have a, a high strength donor specific antibody that we could expect we would never find a negative cross match for those patients. And so with the advent of paired kidney exchange, we're now able to combine both of those, find a donor which is less uh, uh, stimulating allogenetically to the, to the recipients, and then form do, do desensitization, which has a greater opportunity for success. And so the opportunities now become limitless for patients who may have in the past been told they were untransplantable because they had such a significant difficulty in either blood type compatibility or, or HLA sensitization. The next story continues. The, the condition where, unfortunately, during the course of a, a swap, a recipient becomes sick, and we've always said before that you'd never want a donor to, I'm sorry, a recipient to lose their donor, so there would always be a certain assurance that the recipient received their transplant before the donor, but now there's a program where we can have folks that can become a swap saver, and the donor actually goes forward and continues the chain, and when this recipient comes back and actually needs their transplant, I'm sorry, my, my light seems to be fading here, the recipient can receive their transplant whenever the time is right. And so rather than all of these recipients actually re losing their transplants, this donor decides that they'll go forward and be a swap saver. Their recipient then goes up to the top of the list when they are now ready to receive a transplant. And so a number of people still benefit from that paired, uh, sorry, from that uh, chain, and the recipient still does not lose the opportunity to receive a living donor transplant. The next advent or the next sort of ingenious thing is, well, if we have swap savers, is it possible to think about creating something called vouchers, where we know a recipient is going to need a transplant, but the donor wants to donate today and is not willing or interested or feels it's the right time to, for them to wait until that recipient actually needs a, a transplant. And so a donor can actually go forward and become something we call a voucher donor. All of the stuff that we showed before, a number of recipients receive all those transplants. Um, and here's how this voucher program works. So the voucher donor goes forward, does all of these wonderful things for a number of recipients. The recipient becomes something called a voucher holder over on the screen. When they're blue and it's time for them to become a transplant, they're the recipients down at the bottom of another chain. And they get prioritized, and sometimes you know, that's only one donor to one recipient. And so it really is outstanding. They actually do receive a voucher that says that they are entitled to receive a kidney when they're ready. They're identified by HLA and blood type. It's non-transferable. It can't go on Craigslist, so it's only for this recipients, but it's a pretty remarkable thing. And I'll tell you, it gets even better. What's amazing is when we first started thinking about this, the recipient uh, in a standard voucher was somebody who we expected would need a kidney transplant in one year. Well, what if you're someone like myself who has been incredibly blessed excuse to show my lovely wife and beautiful children, if at some point I was interested in being a living donor, but God forbid one of my children at some later stage in their life needed a transplant and I had already donated a kidney, I'd feel horrible. So the family voucher was something that was created, excuse me, that allows for me to identify up to five family members who in the future, if something happens and they need a kidney transplant, they would go to the top of the list. So we continue to remove disincentives and barriers to allow donation to happen, to continue to give more people the opportunity of a living donor gift of life. And you'll see the numbers are quite astounding. When you, the uh, family voucher became available, the numbers of overall transplants, I'm sorry, donors increased, and the swap from non-directed in the blue to family vouchers increased. So more, this was a proof of concept. If we provided this opportunity, would more donors come forward because of their knowledge that if they ever needed someone in their life to receive a transplant, they haven't um, lost that opportunity by donating themselves. So if you look at, again, the overall growth of family vouchers and standard vouchers, this is an easy graph to follow. And it's incredibly exciting to see all the folks that have now come forward to be voucher donors. And you can imagine all the recipients. Because again, this isn't necessarily a one-to-one. -one. A donor, as I showed you before, can sometimes lead to three, four, and five different transplants. And this is a, a, a record of the numbers of, of resultant transplants from all of those different vouchers. Over uh, 1,700 different transplants have happened 
because of the advancements of kidney pair donation and all the ingenious things that we've thought of, of ways to allow people to donate so that recipients can receive their gift of life and the donor achieves the opportunity with which they always wanted, was to see someone that they cared about off of dialysis. How about the logical progression is now, well, what about compatible pairs? What about people that could donate to each other, but maybe there's a better opportunity for a potential looking at a younger donor? My definition of young changes with every birthday. But let's be honest, the older we get, we lose some GFR, and there may be an opportunity rather than having grandfather donate to grandson, maybe we can put compatible pairs in the exchange. Better size match, maybe the ability to find a closer HLA match. What that does is it allows for higher match rates because we have more people in the pool, and it even allows for more of those O recipients to receive their transplants. What does that look like? Again, the number of compatible pairs continues to, my, my graphs are easy to read, right? It's just amazing to see how things have increased year over year. The number of even favorable matches, which are O donors and non-O recipients, that allows, again, for more and more people to receive this gift of life through kidney pair donation. It's really remarkable. This is some data that I recently presented um, that shows that for every pair, two additional transplants, a lot of which were highly sensitized. So again, this works um, in, not only in theory, but also in practice. And this has led to what we call uncoupling. So people that rather could donate to each other as a pair donor are now becoming voucher donors. So that more and more of these folks are separating, even if they're compatible pairs, going in as vouchers, allowing for all these transplants to happen when the recipient needs the transplant, she or he goes to the top of the list. It's really remarkable to see where we are now 20 years following the first idea of kidney pair donation. And then the types of, of donors now is really remarkable. It's like a beautiful rainbow over there in 2021, the numbers of folks that are actually transplanting. Thank you very much, sir. I appreciate that. So a couple more slides. Um, so now we're at this point. So while I spent 20 years of my career trying to stay away from the word match, because I think it unfortunately made people believe the only way that you could be a donor was to be related to your recipient, we're now actually looking from a molecular, uh, molecular model, the way of actually improving the matches between donors and recipients for a couple different reasons. Because thinking about the ability to be able to do that, we might actually develop less antibody, less rejection, fewer graft failures, and potentially less immunosuppression. It's again a, a step forward in trying to do what we do good now even better and potentially last, allow kidneys to last longer than they do. On average, a living donor transplant is about 19 to 20 years. So if it's a young child that's getting a kidney transplant, they sometimes need three or four transplants in their lifetime. We would like to try and improve upon that. And now what our program is able to do is to look at, in an eplet matching fashion, decide whether or not we want to choose these low eplet mismatches so that we can potentially do all those things on this previous slide. There's been a lot of success. The programs continue to grow. We're down here on this left side. This is something which we are very much invested in. We think it's the future of transplant in not only all the things I showed before, but again, allowing for the benefits of lesser immunosuppression, better um, HLA matching. Important for folks to know that folks in the, this paired exchange program actually get some significant benefits, travel and lodging reimbursement. They actually get prioritization as they would even for a deceased donor, but they get a living donor here, insurance and disability. It's really, again, removing disincentives. Because you can imagine, particularly those of lower socioeconomic status, their donors can't afford to take off two or three weeks from work. Well, this donor shield program allows for those donors to be paid while they are recovering following their donation. And what we also have are, it's, uh, it's one of the few times I actually like social media. I'm not so much interested in what people are having for dinner, but heck, I would love to know that someone needs a kidney transplant or that someone has kidney failure. And so now we have a program that allows people to utilize the value of social media to tell their story. Just uh, some personal information, which I'm really proud of. We look at non-directed donors as a, as a national resource. We've actually um, put in 106 uh, uh, non-directed donors since we began the program in 2015, and that's resulted in 319 transplants. So at least three for every one non-directed donor that's gone into the system. What that's also led to, as I showed you, the greater the pool leads to more opportunities, particularly for highly sensitized patients. For people that are blood type O, 100% sensitized, we're actually now able to get those patients transplanted. So rather than folks being told you can wait on the deceased on a wait list, sometimes for 10, sometimes never getting a transplant, these almost unexpected outcomes are now able to be achieved through paired kidney exchange. And what is even better, equally good, is that we are then able to, at the end of our wait list, because every non-directed donor that's put into the program, that program has allowed a, a, a transplant to come back that we then give to our 
uh, uh, wait list. And you can see the numbers of folks from the wait list, particularly those that are African American that were able to provide opportunities for deceased donor transplant. Two big things which I think are really exciting moving forward. The Alliance for Paired Donation has a program called Global Paired Exchange, which essentially says that perhaps uh, a pair in the United States who's unable to donate because of those things I talked about, blood type or HLA incompatibility, and donors and recipients who are precluded from transplant because of financial barriers, the Alliance for Paired Donation allows for this type of international paired exchange to occur between another country and the United States. And in the evaluation of that program, really everybody wins for obvious reasons and for socioeconomic ones. And then finally, the, the current idea is to think about how to use uh, a deceased donor to initiate a living donor exchange. So in the standard allocation, someone who donates a deceased donor organ, the person who's at the top of the list is taken off and you still have all these patients. But if you were to think about all these dark lines in here are individuals who are on the deceased donor wait list who have an incompatible living donor. If rather than giving that deceased donor to the top of the list, if they were actually giving it to someone who has a living donor, their d donor actually gives it to another recipient, their recipient gives it to another living donor, so on and so forth. The potential is, is that we can actually remove a larger number and give a lot of people opportunities through paired kidney exchange by starting off with a deceased donor transplant. That provides a lot of opportunity, but what we have to know is that there still is a, a, a challenge in terms of socioeconomic opportunities with the majority of people that we know who have opportunities where living donation are primarily Caucasian. So we still have a lot of opportunity to think about that. So I, I could, I've said probably way too much in 20 minutes. Like I said, I think what we have accomplished in transplant in the United States through paired exchange and throughout the world is really incredible. We still have, I think, lots of opportunities to improve upon this. I think the future of paired exchange is really to try and assure that everyone in the United States who needs a transplant, who has a living donor, has an opportunity through paired exchange. And I think that's something with which we should all be proud. And so again, I'm incredibly pleased to have uh, been honored with the, the Crody Lecture, um, and I hope uh, to be able to answer any questions for those that might have them. Thank you. I'd like to say I didn't set that question up. That's a, a, a terrific question because I think there's a lot of opportunity. When we talk about those uh, donor benefits, realize that there's a lot of disincentives for people to come forward donation. First off, a lot of folks don't even recognize that they can donate an organ. That's our problem in education. Most folks, rightly so, come into the world thinking I was born with two kidneys. Why would I give one up? And the reality is, again, it's our opportunity to try and educate people that for the right person, they can donate a kidney. The other is, again, that it is not easy um, to donate a kidney, believe it or not, particularly from an, an economic status. While the donor uh, workup and their hospital costs are all paid for by the recipient's insurance, the data is clearly shown that, on average, donors actually spend about $3,000 in order to be able to donate a kidney in terms like giving up their uh, livelihood, having to pay for child care, travel, so forth and so on. And so things like these opportunities that pay for those opportunities are something which we think is going to move things forward. Um, and then in general, it's, it's um, the recipients themselves are uncomfortable in asking. And so we have to make it more, uh, we have to give them more opportunities to, to demonstrate how living donation is safe. And so to your point, we could actually f um, solve the organ donation problem. We could wipe out the kidney transplant list if we could actually bring the number of donors who we know are suitable to be able to donate. Yeah. Sir, please. Thank you very much, Dr. Cooper, for your insight and, uh, and everything. My, my question is about the increase in the rate of the chronic kidney disease, because um, I've been working for, you know, like, for now the past 22 years, and now at least 30% of my patients are at least chronic kidney disease stage 3A or 3B. 
And do you think, you know, first of all, it's going to create the problems in finding uh, you know, transplants later on uh, for these patients? But do you think that, I mean, I was looking at these patients, and most of them have metabolic disease or obesity. Uh, do you have anything about that? Thank you. And now I'm going to, I'll try and put my nephrology hat on, which I'm not smart enough to wear out, trust me. I, I, I'll first start by saying what we see uh, on these numbers is um, uh, perhaps hiding even another important problem we have is that only 20% of incident dialysis patients are actually listed for transplant. So while we are excited about the numbers of transplants, the number of people listed, we still have a huge number of people who are actually never gotten to a transplant waiting list. But to your point is, the challenges we have with primary care, particularly here in the United States, and people who have poor access to care, is really what sort of gives me opportunity to be a transplant surgeon. I would love to be, why don't we put out of business, I would love to have less business by having better opportunities for people to, to have care for their hypertension, care for their diabetes, and pro potentially even prevent folks from developing end-stage renal disease by identifying chronic kidney disease and having changes in lifestyle and, and uh, you know, modifications of diet to be able to prevent folks from becoming uh, end-stage renal disease and needing transplant. So we have, a, we have a huge problem further upstream than when it, they come to our clinic seeking transplant. So Peter, and because of time, uh, just one, one more question. Okay, Peter. so Matt, just congratulations on all that you're doing. Thank you for coming. Um, you know, I tell Garrett Hill, who's the CEO of the NKR all the time, I think you're going to win the Nobel Prize because what this highlights really is that utilizing thoughtfulness, technology, and nimbleness allows um, this disease to be managed in a much more thoughtful way. I mean, Paul Tarasaki, who was big into desensitization, said, Paired donation could never work because we can't do the logistics. Mm -hmm. But Garrett and all of your group at the NKR <clears throat> have really shown that that's n not true in today's day and age. M my question, or I guess just a comment, is you know we have other paired exchange programs. You know, the one is you know as you know, and, and they're just the, the discrepancies are dramatic. Is th is there an opportunity for a a um, more global privatization? or bringing it into the public sector. Yeah. Those are opinion pieces, and I, I'm not asking you this as the UNOS president. Yeah, Just thank, as you. Matt thank you. Thank yeah. I, I would say we need to get there, Peter. We need to have a single national parrot exchange program rather than any that might compete with each other or one that might sort of take away the opportunities from another program. We all have to recognize that this is also a little bit of expense, so actually participating requires an investment from the transplant program. And, you know, unfortunately, not all transplant programs are created equal in terms of their investment, in terms of, you know, the monies that are available. But that shouldn't prevent people from be having opportunities for it. So we have to, I think, as the, the federal oversight of transplant, particularly for deceased donation, sort of looks at removing the number of disincentives and the number of barriers they're presenting, we have to provide, I think, more opportunities to pull more people into paired kidney exchange and give them the resources so they can participate. Thank you, Thank you all very much.